He said it's in G. One, two, I want two, three, four, seven. <laughs> Introducing Jennifer White, musical director on shows including Les Mis, Avenue Q, Sunset Boulevard, Phantom, Parade, and Cabaret, to name just a few. Musical theatre at its best is sublime and is life-changing and I've been incredibly lucky to work on some astonishing productions that have genuinely made a difference um, and changed people's views and thoughts and demonstrate the transcendent power of, of music and drama together. I have a quote here. I'm absolutely crippled by imposter syndrome. I cannot go into a room and say I'm good at this because I don't believe I am. As long as Stravinsky existed or, or, or John Williams, I used to say John Williams, you know, it's like, why am I trying to write film music on John Williams or Thomas Newman or, or you know, I, I sort of, I sort of just believe myself to be not as good as them. How do you not realise how amazing you are? Hello and welcome to The Five Minute Call. This is a podcast where we take a deep dive into the stories of the people that make theatre happen. Today we're talking to Jennifer White. Jennifer has been the musical director on many shows. I'm going to have to read them. Les Mis, Avenue Q, Sunset Boulevard, Phantom, Parade, Cabaret, to name just a few. Her roles also include musical supervisor on Cabaret, La Cage aux Folles and 42nd Street. We are all about people's stories here. And I wondered if you would tell us your story. Yeah, I remember oral tests in uh, primary school. You know, two notes. Is this one higher or lower? You know, just slightly detuned. Um and displaying some kind of aptitude for music, being given a trumpet mouthpiece to even get a noise out of it. Um, and that was as early as primary five. Um, by primary seven, I think I had a baritone horn, which is the the, the, the viola of the brass uh, <laughs> instrument or the brass band family. Um, that's so unfair. I love violas and viola jokes are really, really awful. But the baritone horn is a complete waste of time as a brass <laughs> instrument. <laughs> And that's the Sorry one I got given. Horn players, isn't yeah, it? please don't yeah. give up your instrument. <laughs> it's 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 a sort of ugly big brother of the tenor horn, um, and not quite the voluptuous beauty of a euphonium, you know, but but in a similar re register. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, playing that um, hadn't started playing the piano by this point um, until first year of high school, um, I played in the school brass band, etc, etc. Um, I was really rubbish and so at this point no notion whatsoever that I was going to be um, a musician or, or or any interest. Um, I, my dad was a lawyer, I was going to be a lawyer I thought and then I was interested in being a pilot for a while, still am. Um, my other half bought me a flying lesson which was the most glorious. Oh um, that's amazing. A of hours I've spent. Um, uh, and yes, yeah, still harbour, have harboured notions more like of flying planes. It wasn't until fifth year at school that I um, actually thought maybe music was going to going to happen because it was starting to happen outside of school. Um, but in terms of the sort of formal yeah. education thing, um, I, I, I did my own level of music in, in fifth year and then did a, I was Scottish, obviously, I am Scottish. Uh, so I did a higher music in sixth year rather than any level. Uh, and then went to university. But I really think the relevant stuff with regard to what I do now is what was happening outside of school and outside of the formal education, although there's no doubt it was backed up by that. But um, if if I was to get on any kind of soapbox in this environment, <laughs> um, it would be it would be about the the breadth of musical knowledge that I think has made gosh, this is gonna sound so presumptuous, made me the musician I am in terms of being able to hold my own in a number of different spheres and, and mm -hmm. musical theatre bizarrely however much it's um, criticised or however much it's looked down on by, by so many other um, areas of, of, of music and, and acting um, and that pains me every single time um, is is, is that you actually need to have a, a working knowledge of so many different styles of music to be able to do it properly. Yeah. Um, I, I saw Next to Normal at the Dommer, um, you know, it's basically a, a rock musical. You know, you get electric guitars and, and lots and lots of drums. Uh, but Follies is, is you know, the, the, the level of pastiche that, that, that Sondheim's doing in Follies with regard to, to the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the, you know, all, all of these different years of music. Jazz musicals, um, uh, folk musicals, do, do you know what I mean? The breadth of, of, of understanding. And if you don't have that, those, those musical palettes to draw from, I don't think you can do them 
well or doing so, properly. Mm. So how um, did yours develop? My best friend's dad um, founded the Scottish Fiddle Orchestra and um, aged 14 I was playing the piano in, in the background at a, at a dinner um, uh, and this guy, John Mason, uh, heard me playing and needed a piano player for um, his folk group, the, the Aaron Presbyt Real and Strathby Society. Um, and I had a glorious time and a very, very formative time from the age of about 14 through to uh, 18, I guess, um, before I went to university playing piano for the Real and Strathby Society. The key thing is, as the piano player, you're playing from the, the violin part, because it's a it's like a fiddler's rally type thing, sort of Scottish folk music. Um, and so the music consists of just literally having that top violin line with chord symbols written in so from the age of 14 I was having to make up an accompaniment um, for the fiddle music now the style is, is fairly straightforward but but there's undoubtedly a feel to it there's undoubtedly a, a, a stylistic element um, that, that you need to grasp but ultimately you're having to just reach for chords out of chord symbols and, and, and make up an accompaniment. And so that degree of sort of keyboard harmony and, and facility with, with um, busking chords started really quite early for me, um, while also doing piano lessons and grades and scales and all the things that you that you do. By the age of 16, I was playing keyboards in a working men's club band, um, where again, uh, it's that having to conjure it out of, out of nowhere. Um, I, I've told this story so many times, it's the, verbatim God's truth um, uh, exactly how it happened I set up my DX7 I would have been 16 years old I, my mum had driven me to the gig um, and there's a drummer and there's a singer and we're in a bowling club in, outside Kilmarnock um, and the singer turns to me and says do you know Blanket on the Ground a pretty well known country song at, at the time and I said no he said, it's in G. One, two, and one, two, three, four. <laughs> and that, I swear to God, that happened. Um, now, it was a little bowling club dance sort of thing, and there was the bingo, and, and, and you know, we were basically just a little trio playing in the corner of the room, but it was, you know, I got paid 50 quid for it. You know, so it was a gig. Um, and and that it was a bit of a roast for me that night, but that's essentially how I, how I learned. Yes. Is it true that then at 17, you MD'd a panto? Mm hmm how do you get from 16 what? to 17 doing two very seemingly different things in terms of sort of skill level, I suppose? I think basically from, from the age of 14, 15, 16, I sort of had a bit of a growth spurt musically. And I think it became fairly clear that I, I could hold my own in a piano in, in sort of environments like that and so so the the working men's club bands um the the panto was was a direct spin-off from that um they, they desperately needed a keyboard player it was four weeks of panto um we did paisley town hall and we did a place in Dundee. i can't remember where and aviemore a cinema in, in aviemore that had been converted into a theater um i, I think i believe i remember all that stuff anyway <laughs> um uh Funnily enough, there were one or two people in that who went on to have really quite remarkable, remarkable careers. Um, but the big interesting element, or the, the big box office draw, if you like, in inverted commas, was Andy Stewart. Um, he of Donald Where's Your Trousers fame and the Scottish soldier and all. You know, this, he was a really, really big Scottish folk um, uh, performer and entertainer. And uh, he was playing Baron Hardup in Cinderella. Um, and uh, the woman who was playing Cinderella was in uh, Take the High Road, which was a Scottish soap at the time. And there I was, 17, took time off school. Um, I had to go and speak to the headmaster to see if I could get off for four weeks to go and play keyboards and in this band. given freely? Yes. Yes, it was. That's amazing. Um, I mean, I think they were a little bit reluctant. But, the, but there had already been arguments and fights because I wanted to go and do music and they didn't want me to because I was quite good at sciences and languages and things and, and wow. quite academic. And um, um, and I was going to give it all up and go and be a musician. And um, they didn't throw fancy... Away. Throw my life away, yeah. exactly. Um, <laughs> um, and, and they didn't fancy that much. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, I got time. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't that much time off school because it was over Christmas. So it was maybe the last couple of weeks, and then sure. the, the two week period over over the Christmas break or something. Um, but yes, I I absolutely um, had to ask off and went and toured <laughs> toured Scotland with this little <laughs> little panto on my DX7. Um, for real, not making it up. 
Incredible. It's so fantastic. so what happens, what takes you beyond that? Um, so that was sixth year at school. I auditioned for the Royal Academy of Music as it was then, um, the, the Scottish one, the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. Uh, it's now the RCS, Royal Conservatoire. Um, and I didn't get in. Um, uh, quite rightly, I was a hopeless classical piano player by this point. Um, I'd only been playing since, you know, I just, I, I didn't even do beyond my grade six. So yes, there was absolutely... You beat absolutely. me, I stopped at four. <laughs> Did you? When I failed it. <laughs> um, I no, and, now, and now my piano playing makes total sense to you. <laughs> the, the thing about being a piano player, of course, auditioning for somewhere like that, it's everyone's a, everyone's a piano player. Um, so the competition is incredibly high. From a classical pianist perspective, I was dreadful. But from a sort of busking, working men's club, folk band, pantomime, piano playing mm. piano yeah. player um, perspective, I was um, developing a particular set of skills, I think, um, yeah. which made me kind of yeah. useful. I think that, that sort of busking mentality and approach... Does that make it easier then to approach playing musical theatre where you've got such a diverse range of music? I, I think there's no question that it, it helped uh, and it absolutely was instrumental in me actually getting into musical theatre in London. Um, uh, and that's the the sort of how did I, how did I really get here story, um, which which is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> just, you, can put, you can put that in the trailer. Um, uh, so... So yeah, I, I didn't get into the academy. Um, I auditioned for the university instead, uh, Glasgow University, and did um, music there, um, where the, in fact, I did a, a an exam. Gosh, this is just coming back to me. I did an entrance exam for the university, which was much more academic and, and sort of um, musical theory based, in my view, rather than just relying on the performance thing. At my interview after the exam, there had been an, uh, an analysis of a piece that you only got to hear. Um, you, you didn't see it written down. Um, and you had to write certain things and what happens at this point and what happens at that point and, and, and you know, describe this and describe that. Um, at the interview, they presumed that I had known the piece. But I hadn't known the piece. I just had been able to answer the questions based on... I, I, I don't know, maybe it's the way my brain works or whatever, but that sort of musical ability yeah. or, whatever, or whatever it is, that... Um, ability to analyze it to to hear the nuts and bolts or and hear the cogs turning and 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 it, basically what I believe I've built my entire um, career on this this ability um, clearly was manifesting itself then already so I spent five years at university in Glasgow with uh, the, my middle year in Massachusetts um, on an exchange um, which was rather glorious. Loud and Amateur Dramatic Society needed a piano player for their production of Calamity Jane. I ended up playing that, so that was my sort of first experience um, of actual musical theatre outside of pantomime. I know pantomime yeah. is musical theatre, yeah. obviously, but, but you know, uh, repertoire uh, musical theatre. Um, uh, that same group asked me back to conduct... Uh, to be the MD of a production of Cabaret because their MD, who had MD to Calamity Jane, actually wanted to be in the show for a, for a change. And so um, I ended up conducting a production of Cabaret, age 20, um, which is kind of bizarre given what my yeah. current day job yeah. is. Um, and uh, I should mention that the orchestra for Cabaret in this amateur dramatic production was led by um, Nan Caldwell, or she was Nan White, was her married name, who was um, an aunt of mine who um, played in the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra under Dr Ian White, who was a great uncle of mine, who actually founded the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra. Um, now, that makes me sound like a Nepo baby, but I never met him. Um, I, I never, <laughs> he, he died long before I, I, was, I was born, and, and I've never had any association with that I mean, th there was a musical side to the family, yeah. um, and I knew Nan and um, her daughter Eileen growing up, and Eileen was very much a sort of busky piano player as well, and you know we had a certain affinity. Um, but bizarrely, that sort of classical symphony orchestra gene thing clearly went went past me, or or maybe there's maybe there's there is some kind of element of the DNA um, is is in me. I don't know. Yes, I sort of imagine there might have been this route where I'm get, I get taken under under a wing and and, yes. and end up rising yes. in that sort of um, 
uh, environment, but no, that didn't happen. Um, I was so hopeless at classical music. Um, I think I've got better at it because I've sort of grown up as a musician, but back then I really was dreadful. My piano lessons, my... Um, <laughs> I, uh, Isabel Anderson was my teacher, and um, I understand every single word she said to me now, but I didn't then. Mm -hmm. and, and she was tearing her hair out, and rightfully so, because... Because I just couldn't translate what's written on the page back into music again. And now it's the thing I believe is my greatest skill. If yes. I, I would never say anything that out loud, but it's a podcast. This is what you you're supposed to do. And I've said it out loud. Um, but I couldn't do it until I was at least in my late 20s, if not later than that. And does that come back to the wanting to get it right thing? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but also... I. I I don't know. I didn't. I can't. I can't describe the sort of the, the emotional disassociation, disassoci dissociation or disassociation um, with it. But but I I wasn't connected to myself yet emotionally. I think I think I was sort of very emotional late developer. Um, and um, I don't know. I'm, I'm projecting back then. I don't remember. But I just remember playing this these bits of Chopin or or, or Bach or, or whatever or Beethoven. You know, as you do when you haven't got lessons, you know, on a classical degree, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and and simply mechanically representing the notes on the on the piano, and not even that well. But there was nothing connected. But weirdly, and this is the bit I understand, as Anderson was trying to get me to to realise, when I played something that I'd written, I did connect with it. So I could actually play something that felt like music and felt mm -hmm. like it was emotional and felt like it was it, it belonged, mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't. You know that thing that happens when when you write a piece, or well, perhaps you do, you don't. Some people do. You write a piece of music. You have to write it down. And an awful lot of um, non-reader musicians, non non-trained musicians, hate this part because they hate the idea that it gets. Um, uh, sort of ossified when you when you write it yeah. because you have to make so many compromises to 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 make it fit between the lines and the dots and and the whatever um you have to compromise it squash it um um subdivide you know reduce it re reduce it reduce yeah. it yeah into essentially what is a a, a recipe or or a set of instructions um, it's like it's like you, you've made soup and you desiccate it to make a cup of soup and you put it in a sachet. <laughs> and you've got to put the hot water back in and stir it again yes. to make it into the into the soup again. Yes. You know, do you know yes. what I mean? um, And I really like doing that now mm -hmm. um, because that's the whole point of the interpretation of a piece of classical music is that it's remembering that you have to turn it in back into yes. the music again. Um, I even wrote a song about it uh, in my underworld musical um sorry no i was just about to say you at what point do you start composing uh, oh um gosh no i've been doing that since I, I wrote a piece um when i was 14 I, I i wrote a piece for the school brass band at age 15 that was played at one of their concerts i couldn't play very well back then but i really understood how things were so just from sitting in the middle of a brass band playing the baritone horn i had I had clearly registered all the little the, the ways in which each of the sections of the band um, interacted and how you created a, an orchestration and, and, and the sort of broader textures of, mm. of music. So I wrote this piece. The melody was really, really simple. The chords were really, really simple. I made a huge mistake with the modulation into the minor key uh, because I went to the tonic minor, not the relative minor. Um, but that's just because I didn't have that <laughs> training yet. Um, but what I did have was was the, the tubers doing what the tubers do and the, and the, the seconds and the tenor horns are doing the offbeats because sadly that's all they end up <laughs> end up doing. Um, the trombones at one point had a little counter melody. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, just in terms of understanding the sort of orchestrational and, and, and uh, arranging, arranging nuts and bolts. So, yeah, uh, it was called A Little Bit of Fun and it was bloody awful. But, um, but it was... <laughs> <laughs> it was played in a, a school concert. I, I guess I I started noodling at the piano um, quite early, I guess, because I I really was. Like, I don't mean 
I need to be careful, not offend anyone, but I didn't enjoy piano lessons initially because I couldn't bear the dozen a day and the scales and the exercises that were just really, really dull. What I wanted was to play tunes. And this is a really, really common thing among musicians, I think. And, and, and the reason why a lot of musicians stop is because it's not very exciting. It's not very rock and roll. It's not very fun. Yeah. As soon as I started playing with other people, like in the in the Workman's Club band or in the in the Real Interest of Space Society, um, you start... Um, it, the, the the part that makes it feel like music, you know? Um, yeah. uh, so I guess I didn't stick in at the classical piano stuff until I ended up going to university and I was doing a performance degree, so I kind of had to, and I kind of... I, I fudged my way through my, you know, performance recitals at the end of my fourth year and my fifth year, and, and I was a pretty hopeless classical piano player. But um, my, my facility with chords and, and harmonies and understanding how music works and um, was was developing it and and i think that's what my degrees in. i did harmony uh to level four which is quite you know for for my bachelor's degree um it was just me and alan smith in that class um he's a very 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 clever musician um and um yeah orchestration analysis just just understanding how it all goes together so i know you as an incredible storyteller through music and somebody who who will not let that suffer ever and will always support it mm. with music. So when does that harmonic facility and the, and the structural understanding and everything, when does that meet the storytelling? Gosh. Well, here's the funny thing, is that the tunes that I was writing, I remember my first ever one called it Highland Dreams. I, I, I remember my mum showing it to a music, musician friend. There's no doubt that there was already a kind of trying to convey some kind of storytelling element in that. It was kind of mournful and kind of sentimental and 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 clearly was conveying some kind of musical storytelling, even if it wasn't conscious for me at that point. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, obviously, uh, you know this already, but my album stories, um, which I recorded in 2012, um, was called stories because it's the most common thing. Now, I mean, people, people say this to, you know, to everyone about music making, you think, you know, see things or see pictures or, or, or tell stories or what have you. But um, it was just a, it was a common refrain in, in, with regard to, you know, people hearing, hearing my music. And it didn't matter what the story was, even if it was different. And it says this in, in my album sleeve, um, it doesn't matter if it's the same story as I'm hearing or seeing or, or imagined when I wrote it as long as there's a story happening in your brain with the music and you're happy to listen to it then that's you know that's, yeah. that's a result um so that's why the album's called the stories um but connecting that to the musical theatre thing though I think took a while but clearly it was sort of innate there was a sort of instinct yeah. for that yeah. um but it didn't help me through the classical piano because my god I can hear the storytelling in Rachman and often Chopin and and you know you name it. And, and I, I lean towards um, the Russians these days, uh, Stravinsky, Shostakovich, um, Prokofiev, Rimsky, Korsakov, you know, absolutely obsessed with the sort of um, storytelling elements of, of those. The, the Firebird is my all time favourite piece of music. I utterly, utterly adore it. And uh, Shostakovich um, piano concerto, the second, the first movement of the second piano concerto. I just love it. Again, <laughs> story, you know, just um, innate storytelling. Um, I even borrowed a bit of um, Danse Macabre for um, the orchestrations of Cabaret um, because of the storytelling in it. I didn't know that. Yes. Where? Yes. Tell me. Our production of Cabaret, um, Tom Scutt is the designer and Tom designed this um, magnificent costume for uh, Eddie Redmayne as he came out the stage. Um, if any of you have seen the production of, of Cabri, I know you have, Claire. Um, uh, so so the MC comes out the stage dressed as as death or as a devil or a skeleton or, or something that's sort of not particularly clear, but it's a fabulous sort of skeleton -y, spooky costume and there's there's dry ice and, and, and he appears out of, of the very depths of hell. Um, and the intro to Money, which is the song he's about to sing, Money in the movie um, is a sort of vaudevillian sort of comedy routine with, with coins down the pants and sort of, you know, whatever. Um, and so for me, the, the arrangement of Money didn't quite 
carry enough storytelling to reflect this devilish figure or, or death-like figure um, coming out of the stage. So I felt I needed to augment with a little bit of arranging, a little bit of orchestration, the intro to money. Uh, and indeed the, the dance break in the middle. The figure that I wrote for that, it was, was directly, it's not borrowed, it's not a quote, but it was directly influenced by by the, the opening um, violin passage in Thomas Macabre. Uh, there you go, I'm owning up to it on the podcast. <laughs> no, I think it's fantastic. It's I mean, amazing, in, in, in everywhere you look in, in such a creative space, people are always borrowing things and, and being inspired. And I think it's just a, an incredible way to be inspired by something and put it into a new format that's what i didn't know that and i think it's wonderful mm. really cool um it, it, it went even further because tom had imagined this sort of uh, tarantella thing he was he was channeling a tarantella this sort of dance of death as the idea you work yourself up into a frenzy and then mm. um and die and dance and dance and dance until you die and so we even put in uh, or i wrote this um violin sort of obligato solo for the for the dance sequence in the middle um, which again is is not in the original orchestration, um, but it just it's a sort of slightly rhapsodic kind of violin feature, um, while the devil character or, or death character is is casting spells on these poor hapless souls that he is, uh, um, you know, the ones that, that capitalism capitalism has has ruined or whatever whatever the story is again again there there's a there's a story implied i think i remember saying this to you actually after i'd seen cabaret that i came out and i i, I remember saying it was the most immersive production i have ever seen in terms of you you genuinely feel like you're there in that environment kind of you know the fly on the wall type thing and Yes, there's a big part because of the the acting and stuff, but the the it's the music that just pulls you in and it holds you there and it keeps you in that story, and I think that was for me the first time I had ever experienced something so gripping. And now I'm really happy to know some of the ins and outs <laughs> of why that's so. Well, but there's another hugely significant element, and Nick Lidster, the sound designer, deserves all the credit in the world for this. But when you imagine that if you're sitting in a theatre that has a proscenium arch and the speakers are arranged around the proscenium arch or, or above or, or in some cases within the within the set, in fact, most cases nowadays within the set, you're still getting a, a, a sort of framed picture of it visually as well as orally. You're still sitting outside it, like listening to your stereo. The thing about the cabaret thing is that the speakers are all around you and so you're and, and the band of course are in the space with you um rather than hidden away or, or whatever so so you you are in it do you know what I mean? you, literally you're you might as well be sitting in the pit and but because that happens physically you feel like you're in it and you're in the club and the dancers are performing behind you in some cases what i love about that is that you then become complicit in what's going on with the story because you can't you're not outside it anymore you're not safe from it here mm -hmm. um, and as things start to turn nasty and, and you realize that you think Ernst is just the greatest guy isn't he great he's so charming so lovely and then he turns out he's a Nazi and it's just you, you you can't escape you can't run away you know you're 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 stuck and you can't disassociate from it because well it's just happening over there you know uh, I, I love that aspect of it I was about to tell a story earlier on about my my the the, the lyric I wrote for that uh, reduction of music into 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 lines and dots and things um from my underworld musical mm -hmm. because before um uh, cabaret happened I had this idea of of uh, 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 not the first person to have this idea, but this particular musical I was writing um, is set in a speakeasy, a, a, a um, illicit jazz club in the 20s in Chicago. Um, and the idea was going to be that it doesn't even have a performance space. It's just that it's just a club and the performance just happens around around you. I, I loved the, 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 the way you could blur the edges between audience and um and performers and so you just feel like you're inhabiting it like the person next to you could be a performer then maybe there's an empty seat and the performer comes and sits down or or, or maybe it's you know somebody who's been given a hat to wear just I, I, I this idea you could you could just give random audience members hats to, to you know to make them look like they were 
part, parts of it, and then you would further blur the the edges. Mm. Anyway, I, I, I'm still quite excited about it. And 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 Cabaret, this production of Cabaret, demonstrates just how incredibly effective it is at at making you feel like you're um, not just watching a story, but actually part of it. Mm. Oh, absolutely! I really want to go back to Underworld though, because yeah. I listened to it. And I think it is you, one of the most fantastic things I've listened to. I, I adore it, but I'm also a very big fan of sort of speakeasy. I, yeah, I want to know more. Um, I've been working on this project for such a long time. Um, the thing is, for the first 10 years, and, and it's been that long, the first 10 years of me writing it, I didn't know what I was doing. I was so I was not yet connected to the storytelling. That was a, and also had never read a book um, about writing or anything like that. And I fancied my chances of doing it myself. And I was so hopeless. Something happened, I don't know when or where or why, and pennies just started dropping in terms of in terms of writing, in terms of um, connecting to stuff. And so, and then I started reading books about writing, and and my lyrics started getting a bit better, and my connection with with the emotional side of the storytelling started getting better, and then I started getting um, good people to collaborate with, and and he pressed through that demo, um, which I think you're referring to. Yeah, it's it's some some work that I'm very very proud of and very very fond of the problem is uh, and it's a major problem uh, and one that I, I support and and agree with but unfortunately puts me in an awkward position which is that um the idea that I could write a 1920s speakeasy musical set in Chicago um as a white Scottish sort of <laughs> person I mean nobody you know I can't I can't take that to to the US or to anywhere and, and have anyone take me seriously uh, what do I know about Chicago in the 20s um but it just it suited my purposes because um it's a Orpheus story um and I wanted it to be set somewhere um where I could play with the sort of underworld parallels oh then of course um Hades Town came along um and it's even though it's it's dramatically different in terms of how it's been interpreted and, and and the music different as well. Um it's it's sufficiently close that um when I I won't mention any institutions, but when I took my musical to a particular place, um the the, the knee jerk reaction was oh well it's too similar to Hades Town. And I think that the that how everything is played out and the storytelling within that and, and the way that the the music and the lyrics flow into not just sung and spoken, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I would have loved to have seen it on a stage. I would love to see it on a stage as well, I have to be honest. But what's really interesting about that for me, and thank you, by the way, that's a very, very kind thing to say. And and I need to be careful as well because um, I actually played the piano for the auditions for the production of Hades Town that was um, in at the National and met the musical supervisor. So, so I'm not making any value judgment here, I promise you, because as far as I'm concerned, and I believe this wholeheartedly, um, any piece of musical theatre that gets people to come to the theatre is legit as far as I'm concerned, um, whether it's a jukebox musical, whether it's, um, in the case of, of Hadestown, an album that has been, mm. um, you know, a, a sort of concept album um, that has been uh, adapted. The, the the distinction I want to make, though, is is in, in regards to the the style of song composition. Essentially, it's the the... the the song structures are are um, as you would expect from from that kind of music. They're very repetitive refrains, um, and again, that, that no value judgment. But it, it's it's what makes them groovy. It's what makes them really cool. It what makes them a really really good fun night in the theatre. If you know if that's the kind of music that that pushes your buttons. Um, but what it means is that that there's not an awful lot of inherent storytelling, especially with a repeated refrain, because it can never go anywhere. There's a sort of static quality to the to the song structure, um, and I kind of got slightly obsessed with and and my taste veers towards this sort of more sometimey post Rogers and Hammerstein kind of uh, songs that 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 have a forward momentum a lyric that can take you somewhere that, that drops you off somewhere different to where you got on the the, the bus um uh, and so the the very idea of re repeated refrain or, or a chorus that that um returns um unchanged uh, is anathema to that because it can't it can't take you anywhere dramatically um you, i mean the 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 best example um and is still one of my all-time favorites um from a very very troubled musical but the end of act one of carousel the the soliloquy um 
it's, it's an astonishing piece of musical storytelling in terms of all the the, the, the chapters it goes through and then the revelation and then and it breaks my heart every single time because if, if it's played well if this character this troubled damaged character um has this realization and uh, it's it, anyone who knows the piece will know what I'm talking about. Um, that's what interests me about musical theatre, the way the music can bend to and and adapt to and also lead you um, on those um, musical journeys, on those lyrical journeys, story journeys, is, is what floats my boat and pushes my buttons. And it makes me slightly frustrated at the moment because there's been a huge swing towards um, uh, the stop the play and sing a song and then start the play again and sing a song. Um, that that return to that sort of jukebox style or that um, uh, pop music style, which which worked really well for Irving Berlin and <laughs> Cole Porter. Do you know what I mean? That, that it's not a bad thing. It's just it's not my preferred it's, you know preferred medium preferred style. Um, so with Underworld, um, I was very much trying to write. Uh, songs that although it's not through composed there are scenes but but ultimately the songs do a lot of the heavy lifting dramatically whereas in the other style um the Hadestown style the um oh, there are plenty of examples um Sunshine and Leith is an, is an example I love Sunshine and Leith because I love the Proclaimer songs but I do get frustrated in, in Act 2 when the, the songs just keep the story keeps getting interrupted so we can sing a song for a while and it, and and I much much prefer if the story keeps going through the through the songs so that's what I was trying to do with, with Underworld um, while also doing it in a jazz idiom because it's set predominantly in, in a jazz club however um, the or Orpheus character um, his name's Orville because it's in Chicago in the 20s. Um, he's a classical musician, and so you've got this juxtaposition of classical music and jazz music and then and, and God's music and the devil's music and the sort of and and night and dark and black and white and you, you name it. Um, tr sort of working on, on metaphorical levels is what I'm trying to achieve because I'm trying to do this underworld story um, of, of Greek mythology while also um, having a religious thing. Uh, there's also um, the Orville's soon to be stepmother, not stepmother, uh, God, what am I trying to say, mother in law. Um, Agnes is, uh, she leads the Temperance Society, so she represents, in inverted commas, good. She's very religious. Um, uh, and of course, Hades, uh, Shady, who runs this bar called Shady's, which is the metaphor for Hades. It's not a metaphor, it's a you know what I mean? Mm. Um, um, <laughs> is you know he represents the 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 devil and and alcoholism and 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 having a good time and and Eunice who's been brought up in this sort of religious you know straight you know cosseted and sort of squashed environment um, is seduced obviously um, by Shady um, and his speakeasy and his and the jazz and whatever because it's a much 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 more fun place to be um, and so it, essentially yes it's just a, it's a Underworld, uh, Orpheus legend, parallel thing going on. I, I love that you've listened to it. Thank you very very much. Um, and just just to finally get round that circle, um, uh, the character Styx, who's trying to teach Orville how to be um, jazzy. Um, that's the premise, but the reality is he's just trying to connect him with his emotional intelligence. Um, uh, sings a song about. Uh, or Orville's a classical musician. He's really square and he's really um, emotionally repressed. And what have you? Um, and he he's getting a lesson from Sticks and it's not going well. And he says, oh, for heaven's sake, uh, you know, because he's, he's trying to learn jazz. And and he says to Sticks, uh, "Isn't there a book I can read for? You know, do you have the sheet music for it?" And and uh, Sticks says. Um, it ain't in a book, it ain't on a sheet. Nowhere you can look for a hook that cooks or a beat so sweet that you can't keep your seat. That sound ain't found, notated and bound, enshrined, confined by dots and lines. It ain't the white notes or the blacks. The facts is jazz is in the cracks. And that, to me, is what I struggled with um, in my early 20s going to be, and, and teens, going to piano lessons. Um, the dots and lines, the, the confinement, the, the, the ossification of, of the music that had come out of these people, Chopin, Rachmaninoff, Stravinsky, you name it, had to be written down in some fashion. 
and it was the bit that I couldn't do, which was making it back into music mm. again. Um, and that a lot of jazz musicians or, or non-reader musicians have that attitude to music, somehow making it um, square um, and mechanical. But the key thing is to reconstitute it, you know, in the performance. Um, it's 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 just a it's a mechanism. It's just a means to to communicate it, you know. But you still have to be able to do that bit. And there are an awful awful lot of musicians who can't. And I was one of them for a very very long time. <laughs> I have a question, which is something that comes up a lot with many of my performers and I think might be relevant to your story because it's about belonging in a style and feeling connected to a style of music but not connected to another and it sounds like you had a little bit of that journey. Mm -hmm. How you can feel authentic in and like, you know, you deserve to be there in a space that you don't necessarily feel that comfortable with. <laughs> um, that's, that's hilarious because because I don't. I feel this is this is the awful thing about being a sort of multi-style kind of player in, in musical theatre is that is that I I quite genuinely believe that I'm not good at any of them. I just have enough of the nuts and bolts. And, and a lot of musician friends, uh, in fact, uh, dear friend Paul uh, Saunders, a clarinet player, asked me to write uh, a couple of pieces of music. So he, his pieces of music. He's a, a woodwind player um, and, and he uh, teaches woodwind trebblers, you know, flute player, clarinet player, saxophone players. He basically collected um, a bunch of um, tunes, wrote most of them himself, but but um, asked some other friends to, to write some uh, that covered all the bases that you might encounter in musical theatre mm -hmm. because you can't be a woodwind trebler with a saxophone and a flute and a clarinet without being able to one minute be in Anything Goes, um, the next minute be in Cabri and then, then be in Next Normal, or no, Next Normal doesn't have a woodwind player, but what, what am I getting at? Les Mis, you know, Phantom of the yeah. Opera, you name it. A lot of theatre musicians need to have those tools and I believe it's a huge part of my harmony. I believe I have the facility to do that because of all these different things that I did. My, my classical degree while also doing the working men's clubs and I played in jazz bands and I, I, I did jazz at, um, in my year in, in Massachusetts. Um, uh, I took jazz classes um, there um, and so I feel I've got a sort of grounding in all of these things to be able to fake it essentially the notes won't do it for you it's how you interpret them how you add in the the scoops and squeaks and 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 the things that that make something sound like the thing you're trying to recreate mm -hmm. because unless you know what that thing is unless you he you've heard it and you're familiar with it then you're never going to be able to do that because there's no way of writing it down on the page in terms of being able to authentically recreate something um that's out with you. The, the, the only way is to, you, you, you can't unless you've heard it. Do, do you know what I mean? Because that was the other thing about me when I was a lot younger as a musician. You know, I, I wasn't a good jazz player because I didn't listen to any. I wasn't a good um, classical player because I didn't listen to enough. Um, I spent all my time, all my free time doing working men's clubs and, and folk dances. You know, I, I played more Kayleys, um, you know, behind the piano than <laughs> I know what to do. And, and and country and western songs in 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 you know working men's clubs and football clubs and, and bowling clubs, golf club dances, and you know and the odd wedding. How do you sit in that though? Are you comfortable with knowing enough? And have you? Is that a journey you've taken to be um, comfortable? Yes, until I'm in the in in the in the vicinity of somebody who really knows how to do it. Like if you put me next to a jazz player, then I will yeah. just shut my mouth and just sit and, and 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 respectfully listen and learn and it's the same in it with a classical musician I will just go right no you you know what I mean I, I'm, I'm acutely aware of how not good any of these things I am um but from a musical theatre perspective I'm good enough to be able to make it sound like I kind of know what I'm doing I think um and and I've had that conversation with a number of musicians that I work with because you know though we we all have our um, individual strengths yes. um, uh, and some that we're particularly good at we all have sufficient grounding and sufficient capacity to um, to to fake it essentially that's what we're doing so I mean there's, there's an inherent musical ability in that to be able to yes. you know r rely on you know reach into and, and to um, but um, but no I wouldn't pretend to be um, an expert in any of them
I'm going to list some things off and I'm going to ask you a follow-up question from that because I think this is very interesting what you've just said. So you've worked on Les Mis, yes. Avenue Q, Sunset Boulevard, Phantom, Parade, Cabaret, and then the films of Les Mis, Phantom, and you've done some work on X Factor. From everything that we've discussed today, you are you seem to be a very capable, multifaceted, not just musician, but person with a very diverse range of skills. And I have a quote here from another interview that you did that says, I'm absolutely crippled by imposter syndrome. And I would love to dive into that because everything that you've kind of explored today from the outside, I don't get that. I don't see you as, as this person, as, as, as this imposter. But I'm really curious from your perspective to understand how you see that. The weird thing about being a musical d director now is with, with budgets getting ever smaller and and people not understanding what musicians do and also not wanting to pay for musicians. Oh my God, bands are getting small and, and, and budgets for orchestration, budgets for, for copying, you know, because... And also, as, as the technology has advanced, it's been possible to offer all these things. So, for example, as an MD... It used to be all you would want to be able to do is probably play the piano, probably conduct a bit and probably know your way around a score, <laughs> you know. And maybe uh, if you know a wee bit about how the music relates to the storytelling, that's, a, you know, a, a, an advantage. But there are plenty of MDs who don't know that and just interpret it musically. Um, um, but on several productions now, I have not only... I mean, let, let's leave the composition aside. I have written the music, but but... But on most of them, I've done some degree of orchestration, um, some degree of copying. So that's Sibelius for me on my laptop or my desktop. Um, uh, I'm a avid Sibelius user. <laughs> that's funny because avid now own Sibelius. <laughs> so I'm, I'm an avid, avid Sibelius user. <laughs> that's a niche joke. Um, 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 Somebody's going to get it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so yes, um, uh, Arranger, orchestrator, copyist, um, you know, note, Sibelius user. For La Cage Fall, which I've just done, and for Cabaret, I programmed the Pro Tools tempo maps for the click tracks that we used because I do a lot of Pro Tools stuff and I do a lot of demos of my compositions, whether it's orchestral compositions or um, or, or stuff that I've uh, written for something that people need to hear. Um, I do that on Pro Tools, so I, so I know Pro Tools a bit and I've got a lot of the sample libraries that I've, I've collected over the years. So I do a bit of sampling. Um, uh, I am a conductor, I'm a pianist. Um, there, there are others. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a vocal coach, as Claire will attest, but it's a huge part of, 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 the, of the job as well. Um, and also I know a wee bit about sound because, you know, I, I, have, I had a studio, I, I have a studio-ish at home um, with a collection of microphones and cables and, and, and you name it. Um, but I am not an expert at any of those things. I, I literally have, they're all, I'm self-taught in all of them except for the, the musical piano playing stuff where obviously AI teachers, but, but the Pro Tools stuff, the Sibelius stuff, the um, sound stuff, the recording, um, everything I'm, I'm fudging. And, and I would be instantly shown up if I was in a room with somebody who genuinely knows what they're doing with any of these things. Because, you know, there are Sibelius experts, there are Pro Tools experts that um and and i my the gaps in my knowledge are laughably huge i i i mean i i have the same experience i i wouldn't classify myself really as an expert in any one particular thing but i know many many things like i can program i can you know compose a little bit i can play the piano a little bit vocal coach whatever i guess i'm i'm sort of okay with that because actually i think it makes my output better. And I would argue in your case, it also makes your output better. The, the work that you create and the creativity you have as a result of knowing lots of really technical things and really complex things makes what you're creating better than one person that knows absolutely in depth everything about a piece of software, but then ultimately doesn't know how to go and utilize that in, in a creative space or in a production space. So I think, I, I don't know, I think from my perspective, imposter syndrome is sort of not what people think, but also 
I understand why people think the way it is. I think to be a musical director in musical theatre, knowing a little bit, given that it is such a major collaborative um, industry with all of these different aspects, you know, Nick Lidster and I, he's the sound designer of Cabaret, and like Asher Fall, we're able to talk about certain things at a certain level because I know a little bit about sound. Um, same with, with the Pro Tools stuff. Um, and... Uh, Jason Carr revisited his orchestrations for La Cage of Fall and, and I offered a couple of little tiny little nuggets in the orchestration uh, cabaret I did some orchestra- some extra orchestrations um, so I'm able to talk you know on a certain level with an orchestrator but somebody like um, Simon Hale um, astonishing astonishing orchestrator um, th- th- there, are, there are countless countless more talented people than me is what I'm getting at. Um, and, and yes, I cannot go into a room and say, I'm good at this because I don't believe I am because I know. And, and mm. I swear to God, this is where the imposter syndrome thing came from and I still believe this. When I was writing music in my teens, it was bad. I mean, it was so naive, so incredibly naive. But I would never play any of it. And do you know the reason I I don't play the reason I, I haven't sent Underworld to enough people. I haven't shown it to enough people, or the Famished Land, or or um, any of the other pieces I've done, because as long as Stravinsky existed, or or, or John Williams, I used to say John Williams. You know, it's like why am I trying to write film music from John Williams or Thomas Newman or or you know. Um, Michael Giacchino or, or whoever, you know, people who I, I admire exist. I, I sort of, I sort of just believe myself to be not as good as them. And so I kind of, I kind of go, why? I think there's that's, that's, a couple that's, of things in there that, I mean, I think this is something that so many of the artists that I work with experience. This, why, why would I go there if that person can sing this that much better? Or, mm. And I think... <laughs> Well, immediately, because my whole life is filled with Hamilton quotes, immediately I have a Hamilton quote for you, which is the world is wide enough for you and Stravinsky. Absolutely. Um, but secondly, and it's coming back to what you're suggesting, Aaron, that there is, and it has taken me most of my professional life to realise this, your power, your strength and your unique skills lie in the power of other, in in the power of the fact that it is the very mix of skills that you have in the ratio that you have them in that makes you uniquely you and that is right for the environment you walk into. That is what you bring for the environment you walk into. And and that's right for, you know, my, my collection of skills is right for most of the people I meet, but not all of them, and that's okay. Mm. You know, we're not right for every situation. You, you're absolutely right for the cabaret situation because you've absolutely been a key part of the creation yeah. of that piece. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I got lucky with that one, and I think it has, it has yielded results in terms of what's happened in the in the year and a bit since. Um, in terms of the phone ringing and the emails arriving. Um, but can I tell you, as a evidence of my imposter syndrome, the fact that you said there's room for me and Stravinsky, I think I will, I will worry about that and I will not sleep tonight because that is going to go on a podcast and some and my name, I'm, I'm going to sound so presumptuous that my name should be in the same but you're, paragraph you're as Stravinsky. One, you're the only one assuming that we have to put the two mm. things side by side. Why do we have to put them side by side? But, I mean, but, I put but, them but in that you, phrase. Yes, All right, yes okay. you put them I in the phrase. And I just, it's, 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 <laughs> I, I swear to God, I got a shiver because, like, God, how, how I want to swear, how presumptuous, how, you know, how you, arrogant, you know. Once upon a time, Stravinsky might have thought exactly the same thing. I'm just going to say that. And I think this, so there's, I, you know, I didn't really articulate it well before, um, but I, I think this is like everybody is. Everybody suffers to some degree, I think, with imposter syndrome. But, uh, you know, I, I'm such a hypocrite because I fully do as well. But then when I look at somebody else that is suffering from imposter syndrome and I look at all of the skills that they have and all of the things that they've achieved and all of the amazing things that they're doing, I'm just looking at that and I'm like, how do you not realise how amazing you are? How do you not realise that you are perfectly situated in 
exactly, as you said, exactly where you need to be because you have the exact right recipe ratio of skills for that. And I think you, I mean, you articulate it fantastically, but it's, yeah, but I'm such a hypocrite because I do it to myself. <laughs> but what if I told you it's not where I'd rather be? Well, you want to be a pilot. No, I don't. Want to. <laughs> well, yes, yes. No, I, I want my composing to be earning me enough money that I could have taken some, you know, pilot lessons and uh, flying lessons and, and, and bought my own plane. But, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to be writing film scores and, um, and I would have needed to, perhaps if I'd found this emotional intelligence that I, I seem to think I have or this connection that I... I'm, I'm pretending that I have. Um, earlier, I might have been able to push harder for that, but I, I think I'm definitely better at it now. Which kind of is what happens. You grow up essentially. Mm -hmm. you, you develop all these all these things. Um, but but no, I wanted to be writing music for films and and still do. Um, and the musical theatre thing came along, and I started earning money quite early, and started doing quite well out of that. And and I got stuck because what I would have had to do is get rid of the money and the, and the, the growing career and go and make the tea in, in the corner of a studio or, or become an assistant to somebody. But I was having fun doing musical theatre stuff and conducting. I mean, I, I conducted... I, I, you know, it's funny, we, we, we've skipped on from the how did I get to be here. I haven't even yeah, told my sorry. story about getting to yeah, getting to London. Just just turned 26. Um which is which is not young nowadays. I mean, because there are people you know, arriving in the West End conducting at mm -hmm. twenty one, twenty two, because they've been such and such a musical theatre course and whatever you know. But back then, I was coming from Scotland, where I'd been trying to work in Scotland for a while, um, post university, and then found my way to London, um, which is my big origin story. Although it's funny because that was the that event was the the trigger, the the sort of the the once in a lifetime event that resulted in it. But weirdly, it was all the things that I had worked to. You know, it was all the, the sort of composite elements that made me the person that was of interest. Um, I'd better explain. Yeah. So, um, I'm probably in my early twenties, um, mid twenty, yeah, early twenties, twenty two, twenty three, just out of university, um, and. I've got this background in, in playing folk music, this background in working with clubs, this background in theatre and panto, etc. Um, it means I can play from chord charts, I can um, improvise um, accompaniments in, in a variety of different styles already by this point. Um, and also, I've been listening to musical theatre because um, I was just interested in it. My, my the, the, We had musical theatre stuff on in the house. My mum and dad had taken me to theatre shows since I was you know knee high. Um, so there was an interest in theatre. So I, I had a, a huge breadth of musical experience by the time I, I got out at the other end of university. And I'd started working in musical theatre in Scotland, um, albeit a, a smaller scene. And um, a fabulous uh, Glasgow piano player called Hil Hilary Blue Brooks, Hilary Brooks, um, uh, had double booked herself. She was supposed to be playing for auditions for the Cameron Macintosh organisation in Glasgow and had double booked herself and she, she asked me and see if I could go and play for these auditions. Um, and it was at a time, this was the early 90s, um, early to mid 90s, Cameron's office um, still did regional open auditions to, to find casts for Phantom and Lemis, uh, which were there two biggies at the time obviously um and so I turn up very very green very very naive but I'm sat behind the piano um with uh, and Trevor Jackson was there this is this is what 30 years ago nearly and the key thing it, it was open edition so there's like 300 people queued around the block um and these people are from every walk of life um and they're just we <laughs> some amazing stories of people who just joined the queue and turned up and and said you know what are you going to sing Oh, I don't know, because <laughs> um, <laughs> they didn't know what they were there for. But you know, yeah. um, there's some fantastic stories. We had a guy, I swear to God, sang "Walking in the Air." He was he had tattoos and he had a vest top on, and he sang "Walking in the Air" at you know the boy soprano oh. pitch, um, because it was the only song he could think of. So I accompanied it because I was you know accustomed to to busking and what have you. So. So I didn't think anything of it apart from the fact I did a perfectly lovely day playing the piano and I seemed to be getting on all right with, with these people. 
turns out that the night before, the day before they'd been in Manchester and they'd had somebody from the RNCM in Manchester who was a classical pianist who was completely out of their depth. Now, I'm sure they were technically magnificent, but they didn't know the repertoire. They couldn't play from chord charts. They couldn't busk. They couldn't play poppy stuff or country stuff or, or whatever. I, I had that because of this peculiar upbringing um, I'd had. I just had fingers in all of these pies, albeit non-expert in any of them, but but enough, you know, know-how to be able to kind of, you know, make it up. So I did that day um, and then went back home to Scotland. Um, the following year, or maybe two years later, I got a call to do it again, but this time they want me to come to all of the venues because they don't want to pick up a pianist in each venue because they'd had bad experiences. So they asked me if I'd done them all. And I, this time, just said to uh, Trevor Jackson, is there anyone you can introduce me to in London? I'd really like to come down. And he did um, introduce me to um, Sylvia Addison and Morris Cambridge, who were two of the most prominent fixers um, at the time and, and to a certain extent still are. Um, and um, I got an interview and audition for Showboat at the Prince Edward uh, and ended up third keyboard player and second assistant musical director. And I actually conducted it. Um, so I came down to London, this is 98, um, it was in May and I conducted the show in August. It was the only one time I did it before it came off because it was the only the, the emergency conductor, the second assistant, but I, I conducted it. Um, and that's how I translated all of that weird, bizarre upbringing into actually getting down to, down to London and then um, things just spiralled from there. And what's really funny about, we're, we're here and and. Uh, Carlisle Street and off Dean Street and I had a cup, cup of coffee at Cafe Nero um, mm -hmm. opposite the stage door of the Prince Edward um, which is where I did my first ever London <laughs> London job um, so it was kind of funny coming here to talk about this and actually being in the <laughs> the room where it happened or the place <laughs> the place where it happened we have two questions for you yes Help. we don't know what one of them is yes okay so question one is the show is called Five Minute Call. Can we ask you, what do you do at the Five Minute Call? At the Five Minute Call, invariably, I am struggling to get into my costume stroke suit, stroke whatever I'm doing, um, and makeup. The only time I wear makeup is when I'm performing. Um, because I spent too long going round the rooms to see the company or... Um, at a last minute rehearsal or um, gotcha. I, I, I'm invariably late um, because I haven't left enough time to get ready because of the stuff that MDs need to do before before they go on uh, checking checking that the, the uh, I mean on, on cabaret for example checking that the depth um, are, are right checking that we've got the right keys on the stand because we we did a the understudy said different keys um, th things like that so every guest writes a question for the next guest that's terrifying <laughs> really excited as to what this is yeah oh if you had to underlined had what one thing would you get rid of in the industry and they've added three kisses just to sweeten the <laughs> if I had to what one thing would I get rid of in the industry are we talking musical theatre? Okay, no, here's... here's this, 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 there are layers to this answer, um, or at least there are deep, deeper hidden uh, layers in this answer, but what I would get rid of, um, what, what I struggle with regularly is this snobbery with regard to musical theatre from other forms of theatre, other forms mm -hmm. of music, other forms of art. Um, and the, the one of the layers to that is because sometimes musical theatre deserves it because <laughs> we don't serve ourselves terribly well by not hiring people who know what they're doing in certain areas, um, whether that's composers, songwriters, lyricists, actors. We constantly hamstring ourselves. Um, people look down their noses at musical theatre and say, oh, it's a bit empty or it's a bit this or, or you know, the acting's not very good or whatever. And it's because very often it isn't. How can we expect to take musical theatre seriously if we're going to cast, you know, people that are just going to put bums in seats. Now, I understand bums in seats, I understand producing, I understand money, I understand all of that. Um, I understand it acutely, um, given the, the work I'm doing just now. Um, but I would 
Yes. So broadly, uh, I I wish to get rid of the snobbery, but I also wish to get rid of the stuff that is constantly undercutting us as an art form, because musical theatre at its best um, is sublime and is life changing. And I've been incredibly lucky to work on some astonishing productions um, recently that have genuinely made a difference um, and changed people's views and thoughts and 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 um, and and demonstrate the power uh, the transcendent power of of music and drama together thank you so much for coming sharing your story uh, thank you for having me and sorry it didn't make an awful lot of sense no, it, it makes did. so much Absolutely sense did. and it's so wonderful for us all to hear each other's stories and certainly i am very passionate about this idea of the power of other and mm. what we will bring to the industry that makes it as special as yeah. it is so thank you for sharing your yeah. story there's absolutely people out there that are going to listen to this and go I experienced this I experienced these problems I'm I'm in this mindset or I'm in this this situation mm-hmm. and I think what you share today is so valuable to people so genuinely genuinely thank you thank you so much for watching our episode today if you enjoyed it please subscribe so that you won't miss an episode in the future If you currently are or have been affected by any of the topics discussed in this episode, please see the show notes below for some helpful resources.